Dive In. Bienvenidos a Dive In. Vitajte na festival Dive In. Welcome to the Dive In Festival. Dive in. Bienvenidos a Dive in. Welcome to Dive in. Mabuhay sa Dive in Kapistahan. Üdvözlünk a Dive in Festivalon. Dabro pasalvet na Festival Dive in. Buhi mabayim. Bolit Floritano. Dive in Utsare. Apna de shopol ke janai. Shadow Amontran. Benvenuti al Diving Festival. Diving Festival in Hoshkadis. A warm welcome to Dive In 2020. My name is Margaret Rusty Melkind, and I am a co-champion for the Americas for Dive In. I'm joined by Noelle Kodisbadi, my amazing co-champion, and we are thrilled to be here with all of you today. We are part of 12,000 attendees around the world virtually experiencing Global Dive In. Today, we have the pleasure of being a part of a very special journey that the Joint Committee for Inclusion, Equity, and Diversity of the Society of Actuaries and the Casualty Actuarial Society are on. They are joining Dive In for the first time, and we couldn't be happier to welcome them. The focus on STEM has never been greater in our industry, and we are thrilled to be hearing from the CAS and SOA today on how they are jointly working on advancing um, STEM careers within our industry. During our session today, unconventional wisdom from conventional quads. Global Dive In has more than 500 volunteers worldwide who have worked on putting together these sessions. We are so proud and incredibly grateful for the leadership of this committee in particular, uh, co-led by the SOA and CAS, and in particular, their fearless leaders, Malika Vendor and Wes Griffiths. We are so incredibly grateful for your leadership uh, from all the co-champions here, myself, Margaret, and Dave Bishop. So on to the dive in show. Thank you, Margaret and Noel, and thanks for joining us, everyone. Um, and I just want to extend my thanks to Malika and Wes as well. Um, I'm Sarah Tapama. Also, thanks to the Dive in Americas for that um, beautiful introductory video. Um, I'm Sarah Tapama. Okay, Malika, I believe you're on mute. How embarrassing. <laughs> Yeah, you're here. We're so happy I'm here. you're here. All right. I'm Malika Bender, and Sarah and I are co-chairs of the Society of Actuaries and Casualty Actuarial Society Joint Committee for Inclusion, Equity, and Diversity. And we are so excited to host today's session, Unconventional Wisdom from Conventional Quants. Uh, before we get started on that, I did just have one tech note. Um, please note there's a text chat window on the right-hand side of your screen, which you can use to submit questions in the small box um, at the bottom of that window. And you'll see your questions come up in the larger box at the top. And this can be used both for questions for our speakers or to get help for any technical difficulties um, with today's polling questions or anything else. And all the questions that you submit will only be seen by today's presenters. Um, before we hand it over to our speakers, we want to talk a little about the JCED, as we call our committee. So the CIS and the SOA have been working on diversity and inclusion issues for many years. 
both individually and jointly. But in 2019, in recognition of the fact that diversity, equity, and inclusion goals are easier to achieve when we all work together, we combined three diversity-related committees into the new CAS-SOA Joint Committee for Inclusion, Equity, and Diversity. We're a collaborative group committed to including perspectives from as many folks who are dedicated and passionate about this issue as possible. Um, and in addition to our two organizations, the JCED includes representatives from the International Association of Black Actuaries, the Organization of Latino Actuaries, the Actuarial Foundation, and the Sexuality and Gender Alliance of Actuaries, or SAGA. And our partnerships continue to grow every month. When our committee first came together, we wrote a vision statement. We actually worked really hard on this. And um, so we wanted to share that with all of you. So the vision of our committee is to promote, first, our profession or the actual profession as the STEM career of choice for candidates of all perspectives, experiences, and backgrounds. Also a strong sense of belonging, such that our members fully contribute to advance our profession. And finally, we want equitable opportunity for education, research, and leadership for our stakeholders. So JC has three main areas of focus, and we kind of got to these areas from some market research we did uh, a couple of years ago on barriers to entry to our profession. We know that we have a lot of work to do and a long way to go with diversity in our profession, and when we, we looked at the research, we realized that one of the barriers was awareness of the career as a profession, um, but also there were some other, some other barriers to entry, like the lack of role models, um, academic preparation, um, hiring that may not be as unbiased as we like it to be, and also financial support. And so we structured our committee with working groups around three major areas. The first was career encouragement, and that's really to start to promote the profession to high school and even middle school kids, but also college kids. Um, and the second area would be diversity in our leadership. So that would be leadership of our professional organizations, but also leadership within our companies and trying to uh, see more people of diverse backgrounds um, in senior, senior roles at corporations that we work with, so most notably insurance and consulting organizations. And finally, we want to see more um, inclusion and diversity in our professional development content and our professional development events. So we're creating inclusive, also inc creating inclusive work cultures, um, allyship, and anything that can promote uh, inclusion and diversity at our events and at our companies. Um, one of our partners, the IABA, or International Association of Black Actuaries, actually just released this set of recommendations for employers to increase diversity in the profession. It was a very, very impressive document, um, and we wanted to make sure everyone was aware of it. Uh, they, they actually listed some excellent concrete practical actions that companies and individuals can take right now. And so um, this can apply really not just to the actual real profession, but any, any really any profession, especially analytics profession. Um, we'd encourage you to visit blackactuaries.org and you can um, reach out to them through their website and get a copy of this document that they, that they promote, that they have just released. So we're all working hard to bring the actual profession in our corner of the insurance industry in line with the JC's vision. So before we get into today's program, we would like to take the pulse of the audience with a couple of polling questions. So let's bring up our first question. How would you grade the insurance industry when it comes to inclusion, equity, and diversity efforts? Um, a, everything's great. B, we're on the right track. C, it could be worse. D, barely trying, or F, What's I, E, and D again? So we'll give it a few more seconds before we broadcast the results. Looks like we're getting a C. <laughs> All right, so why don't we go ahead and broadcast those results to everyone. And you can see that most of the people said, see, it could be worse. So we're doing something, but maybe there's more to be done. Um, thanks. All right, let's move on to the next poll. Okay, so flowing from there, where should the industry focus its I, E, and D efforts? So A, increase diversity of employees. B, increase diversity in leadership. C, build inclusive workspaces, or 
D, eliminate bias in insurance algorithms. And you can't answer all of these off. You have to pick the one that you think is the most important. <laughs> interesting results, very interesting. All right, let's give it maybe 10 more seconds. Great. Why don't we broadcast those results? So most people want us to focus on increasing diversity and leadership, very important, and building inclusive workplaces. Yeah. Great. Fascinating. All right. Very thanks. Cool. Let's go to the next slide. <clears throat> so these, all of those four options are really huge and hard problems to solve, um, and it can be easy to get overwhelmed with the things that we have to tackle or to get stuck while we're trying to find the perfect solution. So our suggestion is to start somewhere, right? Rather than getting stuck in analysis paralysis, which we're all so familiar with, um, do the research, it's out there, like that IABA document that Sarah mentioned. Um, so just educate yourself, identify a target issue, and start to take action. But don't be satisfied. Just keep looking for what remains unresolved and who remains unserved, um, and keep adding tools to your toolbox. That way you keep making incremental progress towards your goal. So speaking of progress towards goals and important journeys, um, we're excited for today's speakers. Yay! No matter where you are or your organization is in your journey, these four bright minds have great suggestions for taking your next step. While the speakers are speaking, we remind you to put questions into the chat box on your screen over to the right, and um, we'll try to get to as many of those as possible when we get to the Q&A part of our presentation. So our first speaker, Michael Shaw, is a fellow of the Society of Actuaries and he's the head of data science, machine learning, and AI at Blue Cross Blue Shield of Illinois, Montana, New Mexico, New Mexico, Oklahoma, and Texas, and he's my former colleague. He'll be talking about something near and dear to actuaries and analysts alike, our beloved algorithms. So let's go to Michael's, to Michael's talk. Hi, I'm Michael Shaw. I started my career as an actuary working with data and modeling to manage risk, and I've been leading data science teams deploying machine learning and AI solutions for the past six years. It's been an incredibly exciting time to work in this field because I've seen unprecedented advances in machine learning and AI due to the availability of cheap and powerful computing. That's not gonna change, and I'm not here to argue that anyone should be stopping this express train. However, as these algorithms become more complex, there are also hidden dangers. Many of these dangers involve biases and questions of fairness that, if anything, require even more human insight and understanding to address, not less. I fully believe that AI can and should be human-centered. In the short time I have here, I'm gonna to try to illustrate the complexity of these issues with some interesting and well-known examples, hopefully provoke thought, and raise overall awareness of these issues. Some of the biggest advances in AI have been in the field of facial recognition. So here we have a screenshot of annotated video from SenseTime, which is the first AI unicorn to be valued over a billion dollars, and whose technology is used by the Chinese government for surveillance purposes. There's a story where using its CCTV network and facial recognition software, the Chinese government was able to track down BBC journalist John Sudworth in a city of three million people in just under seven minutes. So this example is a more obvious one and not so hidden one that raises key questions about security and privacy, but it isn't what we're here to discuss today. So here's a more relevant example for the topic of hidden bias and the importance of understanding data. In 2018, Amazon had been working on automating its hiring process due to its massive hiring spree. Behind the scenes, their data scientists had been using natural language processing to score resumes. However, what they found was that their algorithms had already captured the bias of their hiring managers against women. Any keywords in the resume that indicated the applicant was a woman resulted in the applicant receiving a lower score for hiring purposes. Here, the algorithm itself wasn't necessarily inherently biased, 
but it did reflect the bias of the humans already making the decision. So thankfully, after five years of putting work into this algorithm, Amazon was actually able to identify and recognize this bias existed against women. And so this algorithm simply never made it um, into the actual hiring process at Amazon. So here's an example of how the data science team at Amazon was able to ask the right questions, look at the output of their model, and then capture something, and then realize that they should not be deployed because of the hidden bias. But this is just merely one well-known example of something that wasn't put to market. There are probably a lot of things out there, a lot of models in which these biases actually do exist within the models, but they haven't been captured, or in some cases, they've been identified, but they've been decided, they've been deployed anyways. So one example of a healthcare model or algorithm that was actually deployed and in use um, is by a well-known consultant. And so there was a paper published by researchers from the University of Chicago in the journal Science that showed that there was hidden racial bias um, for this algorithm that targeted or determined who is going to be treated. And the reason for that was not so obvious. What the team building the model did was included the cost of medical services as a proxy for how sick patients were. For a variety of reasons, black patients actually have lower medical costs than white patients. Some of that is simply due to access to healthcare. They may not have the availability and ease of access that white patients do. The other aspect of it is that in a well-known study, primary care physicians actually recommended different treatments for white and black patients that had the same conditions, regardless of the race of the actual primary care physician. So here we have an example where the medical costs for an equivalent white and black patient were actually lower for the black patient. So using and including medical costs as a proxy for the risk, the health risk of a patient actually would then lead to even more recommendations for treatment for the white patients over the black patients. So here's an example where if you didn't recognize that there was actually bias in the proxy data, including hidden, uh, the medical costs as a hidden proxy variable, it would be easy to make disparate treatment recommendations for one type of patient over another. So actually understanding the processes that create the data and any biases that exist in the process is incredibly important to detecting these types of issues. So let me go with a, another more obvious example. And this is something that in the credit industry has been well known for quite a bit of time, which is you can remove a lot of potentially discriminating information such as you know, race and income. But let's say that you do decide to include geographic information such as zip code as a proxy variable in your data. Essentially what you're doing by including zip code is actually capturing a lot of these other factors. And you can see based on these three maps of various Chicago areas that a lot of things are highly correlated. So unless you realize or know explicitly that the variables that you're including as proxies capture things such as race and income, you're actually not removing bias simply by removing those variables explicitly from your models or algorithms or the data that you're considering. So here's a more obvious example that probably makes into a lot of models because geographic information is very important in making sure that the performance of these models is, is good. But if used in a way that's not well understood, it could lead to actually um, discriminatory outcomes. So how do we actually address this issue? So let's go back to actually, before we do that, let's come back to a facial recognition example since we started with one. And so one of the things that's been um, well known is that facial recognition algorithms actually work poorly, at least in the United States, on minorities and especially people with darkest skin. So I pulled this image uh, from a paper that actually described 
um, errors in facial recognition models. And it's not to pick on this particular model or authors, but as you can just see based on the images, there actually aren't any examples of um, a black person or even an Asian person. So the question then is, is this model and biased inherently because of the algorithms or simply because of the samples of people from which it's drawing its data? And so one kind of the more well-known and, and funnier examples is I read a lot of psychology papers and professors love using college students essentially for all of their experiments because they're very cheap. But then the question is how well does that sample of college students actually represent the overall population. So it's a well-known thing in statistics and it applies to machine learning and AI as well because they are simply, um, I would say, more complex statistical type models where if you simply have lower proportions of specific types of data that you're using to train your model, your model is just going to perform worse because it has less data to work with. So that's not necessarily a bias in the actual algorithm by including things that it shouldn't. It's just that the data collected naturally just has less examples from which the model can learn from. So for example, if you were to go to Asia and you were to essentially go into the population and draw from that population to train your model, you would expect that model to simply perform better on Asians. Or similarly, if you were to go to, to Africa, you expect that it would perform better on those populations represented there. So this brings up an interesting point where do people for building these models actually have the obligation or the responsibility to actually go and collect more data essentially for underrepresented populations? I don't think the answer to that is clear, but I do wanna bring up that as an example where maybe there is a bias, but there could be significant costs that are hard to overcome in addressing that bias. So I'm curious what some of you may be thinking about this and please ask questions and I would love to have a discussion about this subject. So another thing that you might think would be an obvious um, way to address this issue is to simply just remove all data that could potentially be discriminated discriminatory. So let's actually remove gender or, or race from our data. So the problem with this is, and we've seen this happen quite a bit actually in, in reality, is that it actually makes it harder to detect when those biases exist. So imagine that you've removed gender and you've removed race from your data, and as someone building the model or simply as a subject matter expert assessing whether or not the model actually works, and you see that, okay, is my data biased against certain populations? Well, you actually don't have that data now to actually go and check and look at the performance or the output because it's actually now very, you've made it very hard to actually capture things like gender and race. So clearly the answer is to actually not remove um, those fields. And sometimes it's actually better in your first few passes to actually include that data. So you can explicitly test for the results of your model and whether or not it has hidden biases or in this case, even explicit biases against certain populations. So the obvious kind of thing is, which is to make the data uh, blind in certain ways, um, can actually harm your overall goals of addressing this, these issues of hidden bias. And okay, so with that, I think there's one thing to take away from this, this uh, my presentation, which is I've kind of introduced some of these issues and I haven't really talked about the solutions, but I believe one way to have people really make progress on this is to simply ask about how bias and fairness was addressed. So if you're the user, which I imagine most of you are, you actually probably should just ask the people who built the model or built the algorithm. How was it used? Did you guys consider bias and fairness when building it? Get that conversation started. And of course, if you're the person actually sitting down working with the data, you definitely should look at it and really be able to explain and interpret your model so that you can capture these things. So hopefully what I've done today is, you know, introduce this topic and kind of show why it's really important to still have human intervention in something that may be automated. 
So only with humans understanding the underlying data, how those processes were generated, and we're really far away from machines even being able to acquire that level of understanding, can we all collectively begin to address this issue. And so with that, it's been a pleasure uh, talking about this topic. It's something that is, is highly relevant today, and you probably even read a lot of news articles. And so hopefully um, during the Q&A session, I would love to discuss more with you and answer specific questions that you might have. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Michael, so much for that. Um, wow, there's some really good stuff to think about. And some of those examples are just stunning, really. And it makes me think a lot. So I'm, I'm really curious to hear what other people think. Uh, again, we remind you to just go ahead. I, uh, I know a couple questions have come in on Michael's talk and uh, we welcome additional questions or thoughts about that. We'd love to have that in the discussion period. Um, and so that kind of brings us to our next live poll, poll question three. So who, all of you please answer, who should bear the most responsibility for eliminating bias in insurance and our algorithms? Um, and, and Michael mentioned all of these, well, two of these at least. Um, one is the model user or the typically the insurance company, kind of the broader population of the insurance company. Two is the actuaries and analysts who build the models, the model builders. Or three, is it really the responsibility of regulators or watchdogs? What do you all say? Oh, wow. So it's coming in kind of close right now. And again, we didn't, give you, we didn't give you an option to pick all of the above, right? So you have right. to pick one. Sorry about that. Yeah, so the users, the builders, or the watchdogs. I'm still seeing it changing. Let's give it another couple seconds. Okay, let's go ahead and we'll close it out just to keep things moving. So it was it was running very close between the users and the builders, um, and I think the builders win. So it's pretty <laughs> that's pretty interesting. Um, so yeah, and I mean as Michael mentioned, everybody does bear a little bit of responsibility, right, for this. So um, it looks like we're all sort of thinking about how we might be responsible. Um, and I think one of the ways that we ensure against bias in our models is by building diverse teams. Um, but even when you have a diverse team, we often still have to break through the biases in our own brains um, and build inclusive workplaces to succeed. So our next speaker, Dr. Talithia Williams, is a board member of the Casualty Actual Society, and she's a professor at Harvey Mudd University. She's going to give us a window into her own experiences of being in a profession that hasn't always gotten that inclusion piece right. So let's go ahead and dive into Talithia's talk. Hi, everyone. I'm super excited uh, to have a chance to speak at the Dive-In Festival and to share um, some of my experiences with you today. So let's just jump right in. Great. Um, as Malika mentioned, my name is Talithia Williams. I'm a professor at Harvey Mudd College uh, in the math department. And um, today I really want to sort of share with you uh, some of my experiences uh, in the mathematics community, in the mathematical sciences, um, and in particular ways uh, that they haven't always been as inclusive as we think about how we might broaden participation in the insurance industry, uh, ways that we might reach a, a broader audience. Um, I'd love to start with just a little bit of background about myself, just so you can understand uh, the perspective that, that I come from. So uh, I, as an undergraduate, I went to Spelman College in Atlanta, Georgia. Spelman is a historically black college for women. And there I majored in math. And you know, it was uh, shocking to me. That was the first time that I ever met uh, black women who were mathematicians. Here I am pictured with uh, Dr. Etta Faulkner, one of my math professors. And she was one of the, the first American women to get a PhD in mathematics, uh, black American women. And, and so I had teachers who, who looked like me and I was learning mathematics from women who looked like me. And that was that was sort of the moment that I imagined that I could actually become a mathematician. Um, I went on to Howard University and it was so amazing to be in these spaces uh, where there were African-Americans who were, who were doing mathematics, um, who were practicing mathematicians and who also looks like me. Um, 
I uh, spent summers at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. And so I spent three summers working at, at uh, JPL in Pasadena. And I think, you know, what was so um, critical at this point was I got to work in the lab of Dr. Lonnie Lane, who you see pictured here. And Lonnie really embraced uh, my mathematical ability in a way that was very affirming. And he invited me to the table. I was a part of uh, solutions. We got to work on um, projects for the Europa mission. And, and so that for me was an environment working with very diverse scientists, uh, all at the top, you know, cutting edge of their fields. We're doing amazing things. Uh, Claudia Alexander also worked at JPL. She was my mentor there as well. And so I was really sort of steeped in this like embrace from the mathematical sciences community of, of what I could do and who I could become. Um, but not all of my experiences were like that. Uh, really, they were, um, there were some moments that were really challenging uh, for, for me. One of those moments was um, in graduate school. And so in this picture, uh, you see Dr. Christine Darden in the center. I don't know if you've seen the movie Hidden Figures, but Hidden Figures talks about um, African-American women who played a role in the space race. And so um, in this movie, it highlights the work that they did uh, in helping us uh, get, you know, get, get a man to the moon. And it highlights really the diversity of the contribution of, of those women to NASA and, and to the space center. And so here where you see Christine, uh, it's interesting who you see around her as she's with other NASA scientists, because um, from my experience, you know, coming up as a statistician and working on a PhD in statistics, I was often surrounded with people who didn't look like me as we sort of worked toward this shared goal. Um, here on the right side of your screen, you see a picture of me. This is at graduation uh, when I was getting my PhD. Um, but one experience in particular I want to share with you is as a fourth year graduate student, um, I was at a conference. I went to a conference for the first time by myself uh, without my advisor. And I was really excited uh, to come and to, to participate. Um, and I remember getting on the elevator at this, this conference and I got on and there was a guy in there, an um, older white gentleman. And I said, hi, good morning. I'm so excited to be here. And he kind of looked like, who's this crazy woman who's all excited at eight o'clock in the morning. And he just said, well, I'm going to the basement level. And I was like, me too. Um, and so we went down to the basement level. We didn't say much else. Uh, again, I was thrilled to be there to meet all these statisticians who I'd looked up to and I'd admired and I'd studied from their textbooks in grad school. And so as we get off the elevator, we're walking up to uh, the registration table. And, um, and we get up to the table and there's this nice la lady behind it and she looks up and, you know, she looks at him and then she looks over at me and she looks back at him and then she looks at me and, and she says, ma'am, are you at the right conference? Because there's another one right down the hall. And I remember thinking like, oh, well, that was odd. Uh, yeah, you know, I can read the sign is huge. And, you know, here's my name tag. I see my name. And it was really um, awkward in that moment because I, I sort of felt like, well, why would she ask me that? And, you know, we sort of walked up to the table in tandem, but, you know, she was very particular in looking at me and wondering if I was in the right place. Um, so I left the table. I went over to get some, some of the continental breakfast that was out and the uh, gentleman from the elevator came over and uh, and he goes, he looks over at my name tag and he says, oh, you're at Rice University. So do you know David Scott? Do you know so-and-so? And I thought, well, golly, I just, I was just trying to talk to you uh, in the elevator. And, and um, you know, you, you didn't seem very approachable in that moment, but um, somehow it felt like my name tag, tag validated a, a conversation. Um, and so I share that to say, you know, as Michael mentioned in the previous talk, um, these biased algorithms are constantly at work in our own mind. And we have to intentionally interrupt this mindset. Um, no one at the conference was necessarily mean to me. No one was, you know, ugly or anything. But at no point did I really feel like I belonged in the community. 
Um, it was several times throughout the conference that I was asked if I was in the right place. And, you know, if I, oh, let me see your name tag before you come in, even though it seemed like others were sort of just walking in freely. Um, and so I, I want us to, to think about ways that we create spaces that maybe inadvertently leave people out, especially people who maybe don't look like the rest of the folks in our community. And that was an example that sort of sits with me today of a moment where I really didn't feel accepted by the statistics community. I really, in that, in that space, in that moment, felt like an outsider, uh, felt like sort of people were wondering if I was in the right place, in the right space, um, and if I should actually be there. And so, you know, in, in coming out of that space and um, finishing uh, my PhD, it's made me much more thoughtful and conscious about ways that I try to help um, change uh, our profession for the better. And for me, it means really trying to build a pipeline of the next generation of women and women of color who are going to come behind me. And so two ways that I've really worked to do that that I'd like to challenge you to think about as well is one through mentoring um, at Harvey Mudd for the past 10 years I've done a conference for African-American Hispanic uh, underrepresented girls of color where I invite them to our campus uh, for one a one-day conference on STEM uh, introduce them to women and underrepresented minorities who are doing work in the STEM field. Um, I've also started doing a, a conference for their parents to talk to their parents about why um, it would be great to help, you know, help your daughters do well in math and science and, and data science. And so really thinking about how we can build up the pipeline, how we could really increase the number of people who are interested in, um, in the sciences and data science and math and statistics. And so that's been a personal desire of mine because I've been in these spaces where I've been the only and wondered where all the other uh, women were. And, and then lastly, I've written a book, Power in Numbers, The Rebel Women of Mathematics, that really highlights the work of women who've come before us, especially women in the mathematical sciences, and some of the work that they've done and some of the challenges that they have faced. And so um, I leave this behind, too, for young girls who are coming up so that they can be inspired, so that they don't have to be, uh, you know, a college student before they finally meet someone who looks like them who does mathematics. And so I want to leave you with a few key takeaways as well. Um, and it's it's simple, things that I think you can start doing immediately. First is to really be thoughtful about the experiences of others in your space. Uh, I think, you know, the conference that I was at, no one was really intentionally trying to make me not feel welcome, but I don't think they were really thoughtful about my experience in that space and how I was being treated. And so I want to challenge you as you go to conferences, as you interact with people on your job, at your work, to really be thoughtful about um, how they're experiencing the space and how that might be different from you. Uh, also be an inclusive ally. How can you really make an effort to get to know and understand other people in your work environment? Um, how can you understand others in your community to sort of bring them into your space? And then lastly, how can we all work to make our environment more inclusive? Um, you know, I, I, I think back on what could have, what, uh, could have been different about that interaction. And, you know, when I think about Elevator Guy, uh, in the moment where, you know, I was sort of being questioned about whether I belong in this space, you know, I think, oh, had he said, had he just turned and said, well, why would you ask her that? You know, and and of course she belongs in this space. You know, why wouldn't she? You know, if he had sort of stepped in and almost sort of defended, uh, you know, this accusation, I think that would have just made me feel very differently. But in sort of looking on, it almost made it seem like he was in agreement with what she was saying. And so I wanna challenge you to work to be um, an inclusive ally and to make your space inclusive as well. Thank you so much. Thank you, Talithia. So, you know, we always hope that we'll be in, inclusive in moments like what Talithia described. So our next polling question is, you're an elevator guy. What would you have realistically done in that moment? Um, because we know we don't always do what we should, right? So would you have done nothing? Speak up for yourself. Um, say, would you, why did you ask her that? 
when the check-in person questioned why she was there? Or would you apologize for that check-in person later? Hmm. Pretty interesting. I think people are being honest. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> All right, we'll give it another 10 seconds, so get your answers in. People can't hear us. <clears throat> there might be a, a bit of a tech issue. People aren't able to hear. So just again, we're going through this polling question, so hopefully you all have um, had a chance to answer that. And why don't we go ahead um, and broadcast the results? So your elevator guy, what would you have done realistically in that moment? Don't worry, everybody who couldn't hear, you didn't miss anything just talking about the polling <laughs> question. Yeah, we were just rambling. <laughs> so uh, uh, a fair, about half said, why, why would you ask her that? So in the moment, you would have jumped in and been an active ally, so that's great. Um, a good, almost a third said they would apologize later, so maybe taking a, a baby step towards allyship, um, and almost 20% said, you know what, she can do, she can speak up for herself, so thank you all for that honest answer. <laughs> I love that. I just want people like, to see that I'm, I'm looking at the data here like, hmm. <laughs> It's really hard to know, though, like what what you would actually do in that moment. And I know we all want to believe we would we would jump in and be the best ally we can be. But sometimes it's it's hard. But I do think allyship isn't just apologizing later. Allyship is jumping in and saying, why would you ask her that? So uh, appreciate uh, everybody's honesty in this one. Um, and we'll be kind of exploring this a little bit further with our next speaker, Alejandra Nolivos, and she's a fellow, fellow of the Casualty Action World Society and Senior Director at Willis Towers Watson. She's going to share her experience retraining her brain and honing her allyship skills by becoming an outsider herself. So on to Alejandra. Hello, I am uh, Alejandra. I'm a Senior Director with Willis Towers Watson. And my topic today is Growing Through Global Experiences. So I'm not the most well-traveled of actuaries, but I have had the opportunity to live in different places and I have thoroughly and shamelessly taken advantage of the many opportunities I've had to work with colleagues and clients around the world. So today is about what I have learned and about how global experiences can foster diversity and help us grow in our careers and personal lives. By the way, I have to say my views are my own and not necessarily those of my employer. I'll start by giving you some background on me and how this came to be. Then I'll cover the main learnings, and those include an awareness of being an outsider and also how to build upon experiences. And finally, why I think we should all embrace global experiences. So let's call this the origin story. I had a head start. My origins and upbringing sparked a curiosity for how other people live. And that could have outweighed any natural reluctance that I may have had to explore and, and make changes. I was born in the early 70s in Argentina, and uh, as many in my generation, I am the granddaughter and great-granddaughter of immigrants. I was basically born into a mix of cultures, and it's interesting because food and last names spoke of pretty courageous journeys to the Americas in a not-too-distant past. At an early age, I moved to Brazil with my family and I learned an important lesson. It is possible and occasionally fun to function in two different countries. Now, you wouldn't think that Brazil and Argentina have different cultures, but they do. Drama ensued as we moved back to Argentina just short of my 15th birthday. Two cultures wasn't quite as fun this time. School was different, social norms were different. I was 15. Well, I survived. Shortly after I graduated college, an opportunity came up to move to the U.S., and obviously the answer was a resounding yes. I haven't moved countries since then, but thankfully, my work gives me plenty of opportunities to interact with people from all over the world. 
I take those opportunities without hesitation. In a typical week, I will work with colleagues or clients in Europe, Asia, Latin America, and North America. So here I am. So what did I learn? What did I learn by living and working across borders? It has definitely enriched my life. I really get a kick out of learning, learning things about my colleagues' daily lives, whether in Paris, Singapore, or Rio. I've had tips from clients and colleagues that allowed me to discover books, new music, movies. I took wonderful walks and hikes, and I've had delicious meals, thanks to the knowledge that they imparted. And no matter the sporting event, I can be sure that one of my home teams will do well. Those teams are the USA, Brazil, or Argentina. But my life is better in other much broader and deeper ways by working with people around the world. I now know that I can find something in common with anyone I meet or work with. I am flexible, I'm adaptable. I learned other ways of doing things or not doing things or doing other things, I'm much more creative. But very important and very relevant to today is that I learned how it feels to be an outsider, even among well-meaning and welcoming people. And I became much more aware of how different cultures shape the way each of us works and how important it is to create environments that give people and teams a chance to perform at their best. I, the outsider. So when I came to the US, I really felt in my own skin what it was to have to function without all the tools and not quite knowing the rules. Maybe you don't speak the language or you don't know the customs, the food isn't quite what you're used to. Mm -hmm. Now, don't get me wrong, those can be all great things because they mean that they're interesting things to discover and to learn. But in a professional setting, they can be obstacles to great performance and advancement. Shortly after I had arrived in the US, I had a job interview over lunch. And this is a, a neat story of not knowing the rules. I did not know Americans ate salad as a starter. So in Argentina, it is usually a side dish. So I walked over to the buffet, put some salad and a main course on my plate, and I went back to the table. My interviewer took a look at my plate, puzzled, and remarked, and I'm sure he was joking, I'm sure he had no real intent, um, but the remark was that I could always go back and get more food if I wanted, and I didn't need to get it all at once. So imagine this, I was a year or two out of college and in a new country. I had no idea what he had meant. Had I loaded up my plate? Was I being rude? Did it look like I hadn't eaten in months? Well, it made for a very stressful and awkward lunch slash job interview. I'm sure I was not in my best. Now, the epilogue is I did get the job and I still work for that company. Also, differences in culture can make you feel isolated. When you arrive at work in Argentina, you say hi and usually give a kiss on the cheek to basically everyone in the office. And lunches are social and rarely at one's desk. And as you know, that's not the case in the, in the United States. But what I really remember most vividly was speaking English all day at work. So even though I was fluent, I had taken years of English lessons and I, I, mean, I was very good at it, I would come home physically exhausted. And those of you who know actuaries know that the actuarial work isn't particularly exerting. But no English lessons can prepare you for working eight to 10 hours in a foreign language. So my takeaway, I learned that being an outsider can make what looks like simple or normal things extra difficult. And it is so easy to be thrown off your game by not knowing and wondering which rules you broke and which rules you basically don't know about. So let me give you a challenge. Find a situation to put yourself in when you are an outsider. So maybe it is an experience abroad in person or virtually, but it doesn't really need to be. It's just taking up something you never did and have little practical knowledge of. Think about how you feel and what obstacles you find to be your best. Building. I did learn over the years, and I'm really still learning, that it's important to be sensitive and proactive 
to create an environment that will allow multicultural teams to really deliver on their potential, which is awesome. So actually, just a few months ago, I had a learning opportunity. Um, let me tell you how it was. We had a, a team of mid-career colleagues just participating in a call with a client. Two of them were from North America and two from other countries. All of them smart and capable with good communication skills. They belonged at that conversation. But the two North American colleagues dominated the conversation, and that was not because they were selfish or conceited, but simply because they had a more assertive mindset. So it was a cultural thing. The two other colleagues came from cultures that value collaboration and teamwork above individual recognition. And they were less active and really did not shine as I know they could have. Um, their contributions were far less than they could have been, and frankly, we were all the worse off for that. Lesson learned. Next time, I prepped the team appropriately. I gave specific um, speaking roles to, to each one, and I was attentive to the flow of the conversation. I steered it so that all points of view were expressed. Another thing that I learned is to be patient. Different styles, cultural norms, and language proficiency levels can result in communication that's really not as fast-paced or perhaps as straightforward as Americans are used to or expect in a business setting. But it doesn't mean that it's less valuable. I make an effort now to listen to every word, and I stop myself from well-meaning interruptions or translations. It's somebody else's time to shine. If they need my help, they will ask. I just need to make sure they know they can ask. And finally, I became a connector. The importance of building relationships really cannot be overstated. So I have taken upon myself, and I encourage you to do it, to make sure that professionals have opportunities to network outside their normal or local environments. I make introductions, I encourage and champion outsiders so they continue to succeed and we can all benefit from their contributions. So I have a challenge for you. Find an outsider and make them an insider. Maybe it's somebody who doesn't play golf or has family responsibilities that keep them from happy hours. Somebody who is quiet at meetings. It doesn't need to be somebody from another country or another culture, although that's it's really interesting. Let's take a step back here. How can a global experience make you a better and more engaged professional? How is that global experience, how is it that it will help you grow? So this had me at Variety's the, space, the Spice of Life. And if that wasn't enough, global experiences will help you grow as a person and in your career. So things it will do for you. It will teach you to see things from different perspectives. It will make you more creative and more likely and able to lead or foster innovation. It will make you more self-aware. It will teach you about your own cultural values and your own cultural biases. Through practice, daily practice, it will greatly improve your networking and partnership building abilities. It will introduce you to broader career options, options you didn't know existed, and it will give you the confidence to go for them. It will increase your adaptability, your flexibility, and your communication skills. And it will give you the tools and confidence to build effective, diverse teams. So this is not going to be talk. You will know and you will live the fact that diverse teams and inclusive teams perform better. And you'll know how to make it happen. So my recommendation is if and when you get the chance to have a global experience, go for it. Thank you so much, Alejandra. That was great. I could not agree more about creative creativity and innovation being um, spurred on by diverse and inclusive teams. Um, it's one of the most important things we can do, maybe the most important thing we can do to spur innovation and creativity in workplaces. So thanks so much. And related to that, we're going to go on to our next polling question. And I hope the sound is okay this time and everyone can hear us. Um, so you're at a team lunch and a colleague originally from another country does something unusual, causing other teammates to poke fun at him. What do you do? Do you A, join your colleagues in making jokes? B, stay quiet and leave it alone? C, explain the local culture afterwards? Or D, start a lunch conversation about various food cultures? I'm, I'm loving this question because- um, Be honest. Well, first of all, I, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> everyone's being honest. Um, but it's, it's, a, it's a great question. And you know, I think 
as someone mentioned in one of the comments earlier, uh, you might have answered one way before this presentation, and maybe you'll answer a different way after this presentation. And that's what we're hoping for. Is it bring, you know opens your eyes to some some new ideas and some new thoughts. So let's give this a couple more seconds. It looks like just about everyone is going to start a conversation about food cultures, which is great. <laughs> All right, should we go ahead and broadcast the results? Let's go ahead and do it. You're all definitely learning those active allyship skills, right? 90% want to start a conversation. Good job. It shows that you're listening. Um, and if you're listening, you heard what Alejandra said, right? Being your whole self at work can be exhausting, um, but it can also be really rewarding. And there are some great examples of people just being who they are and by doing so opening doors for others. So our last speaker, Karen DeToro, is a fellow of the Society of Actuaries and she's chief actuary for CNO Financial. She's going to share some stories about her path and the doors that it opened up for her and for others. Take it away, Karen. We all have more choices than ever before. More choices about whether and who we marry how to raise our children, and where and how we work. Today, I'm going to tell you about some of the conventional and unconventional choices that I've made in my career. And I wanna talk about how the choices you make can help you see the world in a new light. These choices can help others see you in a new light. And the choices you make can even change the way others see the world. When I was growing up, I wasn't particularly focused on my career. Uh, I expected I would go to college, study something interesting, and find something interesting to do. Um, beyond that, I expected I would probably get married and have kids, and then maybe take a break from working to raise my family. It was the life all of the women around me had, so it seemed pretty normal. I certainly didn't set out to break traditional gender norms. But my life has turned out very differently from what I thought growing up. And my career as an actuary has presented me with an opportunity to make lots of choices. I'm going to tell you three stories about choices that my husband and I made through the course of my career. The first choice was choosing to work. In the fall of 2001, life was going great. I was almost done with my actuarial exams. I was starting an MBA program in January. And in September of 2001, I met Jeff, the man who would become my husband. I had been in consulting for six years at that point and was doing well there, but I was traveling a lot in my consulting job and our relationship was heading quickly towards marriage. So I decided to leave consulting and take a corporate role in July of 2002. And it turned out to be a great choice. I was with that company for four years and the job gave me extremely valuable experience in a technical actuarial role. I still wasn't sure at that point if I would stay home when I had children, but I figured that this job would make it easier to juggle work and family responsibilities if I chose to continue working. So fast forward three years. It's the summer of 2005 and Jeff and I are expecting our first child in October. We have three months to figure out what to do about childcare. And we had three options. I could stay home, Jeff could stay home, or we could both keep working and put our baby in daycare. Now, I loved my job. I made $20,000 a year more than my husband, and I had just completed my MBA in 2004. Meanwhile, my husband didn't love his job. He was at a crossroads and he didn't know what his next move should be. So we agreed that it made sense for him to stay home with the baby. I left work on October 1st, and I gave birth to our son Johnny on October 5th. Jeff left his job right before Christmas, and we spent the holidays together before I went back to work. My husband was choosing to give up a career that he had invested in. And I was choosing to give up being the primary caregiver for my kids. This experience challenged us to think differently about ourselves. Jeff and I first had to challenge our own assumptions about gender roles to even get to the discussion of who would work and who would stay home. And we had to accept that we were making a choice that flew in the face of societal norms. The second choice we made was choosing to work harder. Six months after our son was born, my company was going through a downsizing. 
and they were offering employees the opportunity to voluntarily resign with severance. I'd recently been working with some outside consultants on a project, and I was sitting there across from them one day, thinking about how much I missed consulting. And so I called my husband that day at home with our six-month-old son, and I told him that my company was giving us severance to leave and that I really wanted to go back to consulting. And he agreed, despite knowing the difficulties of consulting from my prior time in the field. I reached out to my network, and within two months, I was a manager at a big four consulting firm. By this point, I knew that there was no turning back on our choice for me to work. So we had made another choice, the choice to invest more heavily in my career, go back to traveling and you know, put in the hours required to make partner, and for my husband to cement his status as the primary caregiver. Now, I wound up spending seven years in consulting, and it was a great time. I felt like I could charge just as hard and run just as fast as anyone else. My home life made it possible for me to travel at a moment's notice or work late into the night as needed on a project. I traveled internationally for work, and my husband came with me while my mom watched our son. We made great friends with my coworkers and their families, and I learned a ton. And while doing all that, I had a baby. Our daughter, Natalie, was born in 2009, and I took a four-month maternity leave to spend time with her and our son, Johnny, who was three and a half by then. A little over a year after Natalie was born, I made partner. Now, making partner as a woman didn't seem at all unusual to me, but of course, it is unusual. Despite efforts to diversify, many firms still had a gender discrepancy in their new partner classes at that point. It's hard for women to get to that level of leadership when there are still so many challenges that are primarily borne by women. Many professional women are in dual earner households and they can't always put their own career first. Most working women bear the primary responsibility for childcare, which often means that they're the ones to stay home when a child is sick. So I had to acknowledge that while I was technically a working mom, I didn't experience most of the challenges that that term typically conveys. But being not just a working mom, but a mom frequently on the road presented its own challenges. I was gone a lot, which forced Jeff to operate as a single parent much of the week. And while I cherished the time with Jeff and the kids on the weekends, he was the one that they would run to when they were injured or sick. We also continue to notice gender stereotyping in the world around us, like the mommy and me class that Jeff joined to give our kids a chance to socialize with other preschoolers and toddlers. Or when our kids' school had a policy of calling the mom first if a child was sick at school, regardless of the fact that we told them that Jeff was the primary caregiver. These challenges continue to remind us of not only gender stereotyping, but heteronormative stereotyping in our society. The third choice we made was choosing to work differently. We had this wonderful thing going with my consulting career. And then one day, my husband and I realized it was just too much. Uh, from the first time I mentioned consulting to my husband, I told him that I would work there as long as we were both okay with it. If either one of us wanted out, you know, if we felt like we were losing sight of our priorities, then we would look at other options. Interestingly, we came to the conclusion at the same time, I was starting to have some stress-related health issues that were exacerbated by travel. And Jeff and the kids were starting to feel the impact of my being gone so much of the time. And so we made another choice together, a choice for me to work differently. Deciding to leave consulting also meant that we would need to move as there were few opportunities at my level in the Chicago life insurance market. And this meant leaving our hometown and our extended families. So I started putting feelers out for opportunities. Now, because Jeff didn't work, we didn't have to worry about he, how he would find a job at the new location. And that meant we could go pretty much anywhere in the country. I found a great job in Tampa, Florida as a divisional chief actuary for one of the largest life insurers in the country. I really struggled with saying goodbye to my consulting colleagues. I did not want to contribute to the storyline that women can't hack it in such a demanding profession because I knew it wasn't true. The seven years I spent in consulting with a family showed that that wasn't the case. 
And I also knew men who struggled with the choice to dial back on travel. So I knew it was not a women's only issue. But I also knew that as a female partner, I had a spotlight on me. And I felt bad for not continuing to be the champion for others. But then I realized that by making the choice to leave, I was opening up new paths for others. It's rare that someone uh, will leave consulting after making partner, but we knew it was the right choice for us. And that decision taught me to challenge my own assumptions about career paths and the status quo. And it made me realize that it's unfair to make assumptions about what anyone wants from their career or their home life. Since then, my career has gone even further. After Tampa, we moved to New York to enable me to pursue non-actuarial leadership roles in that same company. More recently, another opportunity presented itself, and I'm proud to be now serving as the chief actuary of CNO Financial Group, a job which has provided incredible professional fulfillment and new opportunities for me. And it's also allowed us to move back to Chicago and back to our families. So I've told these stories today to help illuminate what I've learned about the power of choices to change the way you think and to change the way the world thinks about you and others. So my experiences have taught me about how we view ourselves. Uh, just like the algorithms that we build at work, our brains are full of unintentional bias and we even apply that bias to our own lives and our own choices. Before we can make choices that challenge cultural norms, we have to recognize what those norms are. My experiences have taught me about what others think of our choices and about the reality of challenging gender roles. Realities like the issues dads face in navigating an environment that's historically built for moms as caregivers. My experiences have taught me to think differently about others. It's made me aware of assumptions that I've made about all kinds of roles, uh, including gender roles. And so I continue to try to be alert and aware of these assumptions. I've learned that rather than assuming what someone wants from work, I just need to ask. And the answer may surprise me. And hopefully my experiences have taught others to think differently. I know that my husband and I have upended people's expectations about the roles we play at work and at home. It's happened in the workforce every time I've been able to make a flexible choice about how I work. And it's happened in our community each time my husband has told someone proudly that he's a stay-at-home dad. So you don't necessarily need to make a choice as all-encompassing as this to challenge societal norms within your own workplaces and communities. But I encourage you to think about how the choices that you make, even small ones, might help to challenge cultural norms. Sometimes challenging cultural norms or facilitating others to do so is exactly what we need to help individuals and teams thrive. Thank you. All right, um, thank you so much, Karen, and thank you to all of our speakers. Um, and also thanks to the audience for bearing with us and reporting your tech issues quickly so that we could get them resolved. Um, we really appreciate you all, you know, um, being very proactive. Um, and. We're so happy to have heard from all four of our speakers, and there were plenty of questions thrown into the chat. So I'd like to invite Michael, Talithia, Alejandra, and Karen to join us on video, um, and we will begin the Q&A. Well, let's pause for just a second, because I just heard that there, it sounds like maybe Karen, the, the presentation that Karen did started over. And so, Jesse, I just would ask you if you could help us troubleshoot this before we move on to the Q&A. It would be really distracting. Thanks again to our audience for being very proactive. Yep. <laughs> We're so excited. We have such an engaged audience. It's wonderful. It looks like it's stopped now. Yep. Okay, good. Let's keep going then. Let's move on. To <laughs> Stuff happens. Minutes. Thanks, Charmaine. Um, all right. So while more questions are coming in, and thanks again to the audience for submitting the questions, um, I'd love to hear from all of you um, responding to our first polling question that we asked the audience. Um, so we asked them to grade the insurance industry on its DE&I efforts um, from an A to an F. 
So what grade would you give and why? And I'm going to toss it first to Talithia um, because you are sort of an outsider in our industry Ooh. of this group. So Ooh. maybe you'll have an okay. outsider's okay. point of view. All right. So I'd say I was between a C minus and a B plus. Um, B plus because I think there's been so much progress um, for women over the years and to see, you know, um, women gaining even parity um, and above in some areas. But I think C minus in terms of really thinking about inclusivity in the industry and um, really reaching out to groups that are underrepresented. I think I've seen less progress there. All right. Thanks, Talithia. Really, you know, being honest there. So I <laughs> appreciate that. How about Michael? Yeah, I think uh, I would probably give the industry a C plus, and obviously it differs a lot by by company. And I think some companies are are making significantly um, larger efforts in in this area. Um, but I definitely do appreciate um, the amount of awareness that the dive in is bringing into this issue. So there's there's definitely been a lot of progress for sure. And maybe people will give us a different grade after dive in festival is over, right? Um, let's go to Karen. This is such a tough question. Um, I think I'm going to go with a B minus. I want to be, I'm like a parent who wants to be encouraging to my child. You can get there. You can get that A. Um, I think there has been a lot of pro progress to Lithia, as you noted, especially with regard to, to women in the industry. And I think that at least we're starting to have these really open conversations about it, um, which gives me optimism that we're, we're moving in the right direction uh, and we're trying to do more. But I think that, um, you know, we really need to think, and I think uh, Malika and Sarah, you referenced this at the beginning, we've got to figure out how to promote this industry to a more diverse group of people and really help them see the wonderful careers that they can have in the insurance industry. That's very encouraging, Karen. Thank you. Um, how about Alejandra, last, not, last but not least? I'm, uh, I'm with Karen, so I'm an encouraging mom. Uh, I think we are on the right track, uh, you know, as evidenced by things like Dive In, the, the sponsors and, and companies that are very active um, in fostering diversity and inclusion. I do uh, think that we could be more diverse. It's about um, opening up the profession, encouraging uh, others to, to join us. It's a, it's a industry. It's a great industry. A lot of opportunities. Uh, we just need to make sure that they're, they're available. I'd like to see more diversity of thought, more diversity of work styles, more diversity of life paths and abilities. All right. Thanks, Alejandra. Um, so I think that leads us into our next question, which um, uh, there was a great audience comment early on when we did polling, the second poll, which was, where should the industry focus its efforts? And one commenter said, you know, um, if you focus on leadership, the rest should trickle down. So I think that's a great, great point. So that leads me, to, I guess, a question to Karen. Um, and, and by the way, Karen, I loved your talk, having had a stay-at-home, a husband who's a stay-at-home dad and doing lots of unconventional things in my career, even though I've sort of stayed on the actuary path. I've done lots of weird things along the way. So, weird is not the right word. Unusual things along the way. So thank you so much for your talk. But I guess I would ask, what you know, what kinds of things, other kinds of things? You mentioned, like, challenging assumptions and, and making sure you ask people, which I think is so important. You know, don't assume you know anything about them. Make sure you ask them about opportunities and ask them what they want. But what, what are some other things that we could do to support others who are either on a less conventional path or trying to change the status quo? And I'll turn it to Karen, and then I'll open it up to the rest of you to answer that, too. Yeah, I think it's a great question, Sarah, and one that is, you know, it gives us all something we can think about and something we can do. Um, I think the most important thing, it all starts for me with communication. And one of the most effective things that I've seen is when people – it can be anyone, but I think it's particularly effective when people in leadership roles do this. You talk about your own experiences. Um, I worked with an individual at a former company, and I, and I recall that, that this gentleman was so open about why he would be taking time off. So he'd say things like, I'm going to be a little bit late for our meeting tomorrow because I'm taking our son to the doctor, or I need to leave early on Friday because my child has a soccer game. And I sent him a note, and I said, I don't know if you know how powerful this is, that you are making it okay for people to talk about the needs they have and the way they have to balance their work and life. And this was a, a white male in a relative position of power who was doing this. 
And what a what a wonderful way to really create an atmosphere where everyone feels comfortable talking about their needs, talking about the balance that they're trying to achieve. So I think sharing those experiences really can help push the needle and, and give that support to others who are looking for it. What about awesome, the rest Karen. of you? Um, I do have uh, something to add that I, I heard uh, a few years ago, and I just, just yesterday, reading up on this, uh, I came across again about assumptions. Uh, a lot of times when we talk about women in the workplace, so immediately the thought of work-life balance comes to our heads and, um, you know, family needs and family responsibilities. And that, I think that, that is a, a way of, um, of fostering unconscious bias. Um, it is, and sort of pigeonholing women, uh, we need to, to move away from that. Um, there, um, and, and somehow make it, uh, you know, I was reading about a, a company that uh, had a no travel policy for new parents. So the mothers and fathers, that was it. So mm -hmm. I think that we, we have a, a little bit of uh, work to do to catching ourselves, I think, uh, with those assumptions. Great point, Alejandra. Uh, we have another question for you, Alejandra, actually. So a uh, few people have asked about how can we work on changing our biases, and you mentioned um, looking for international experiences as one of those examples. So how can people working in locally focused organizations find opportunities for international experiences? Yeah, um, yeah, I did. I did talk a bit about sort of my background and how it set me up for you know international experience and kind of now easy for you to say. Um, but uh, but I do think that uh, there are ways uh, to get uh, to get you know all those those insights and, and benefits uh, even you know without even having a passport. Um, you know, you can um, you know don't need to change jobs or. Uh, you know, there, there are, you know, I think about the opportunities that we all have in our professional organizations, for example. So it would be the American Academy, um, the RIMS, you know, uh, attorney organizations. Um, you know, a lot of those have opportunities for interactions with, um, you know, with uh, colleagues and, and associations overseas. Um, you know, uh, University of Miami, I think, uh, has a chapter, has a group of international students, for example. Um, so, you know, you can go and volunteer and perhaps mentor an international student. Um, now, talk about volunteer experiences and, and you know, other organizations have uh, internationally focused um, opportunities. You know, of course, you know, learning a foreign language is always fun and intellectually stimulating and opens your your mind. And, of course, and if you can, to take a big immersive vacation, you know, now that we're dreaming, uh, that, that would be a, a good call for us. Thanks, Alejandra. I have a question for you, Talithia, and because yeah. you, you have such a great academic background and um, not that you're an outsider, but you're, you're complementary to our, to our profession. So I guess I would wonder, are there any best practices that you've seen in academia that we could learn from um, related to STEM or, or anything really that we could learn yeah, from in, yeah. um, in our industry and our profession? We're definitely by no means the gold standard. So, you know, let, let me, let me uh, raise that as a caveat. Um, one thing that we've done, especially in my department, so um, I think Harvey Mudd has one of the most diverse mathematics departments in the country. We've got about 15, 17 professors. Three of us are black professors, and which is somewhat unheard of um, in addition to all other types of diversity. I think one way that we have achieved that is through um, – really direct early mentoring. So finding diverse candidates while they're in graduate programs and saying like, we want you to apply to our faculty position. So really an invitation to apply instead of, you know, oh, only the best will survive, you know, like, oh, you know, whoever will come. Uh, but really like recruiting people uh, to, to be in our applicant pool and even sometimes inviting them out to give a talk a year or so before their graduation so that they can kind of get to know the community. So really being intentional in, 
like letting people know that we want them to be a part. We've also added case studies in our application uh, interview process. So um, for candidates that are, you know, applying to a faculty position, we'll give them a case study about maybe a student of color in their classroom who's, you know, maybe first gen and, and give them a situation to respond to. I think that really helps us to see like how thoughtful faculty are about the experiences of other people in, in their space. Um, and then we grade their response to that question. And, and you know, I think, I think what that does is just also let our applicants know that this is the type of environment that they're coming into that we want to create a really thoughtful space for them uh, and, and for our students as well. Thank you. I think some exciting questions. So I'm like, I, I want to keep it short because I was like, <laughs> ooh, I see some neat chat questions as well. So, yeah. Yeah, and we're actually running out of time, so we've only got a few minutes left. Um, Michael, I'm going to throw you one question and give you one minute to answer it, and then we have to um, do our wrap-up question for the whole group. So um, what's an example of one of the costs you mentioned of addressing biased data, and could that be a barrier for insurers to take that action? Yeah, so I'm going to try this, uh, tie this all together. So I think someone actually commented that, um, that the transcript was, was doing a relatively poor job for, for Alejandra. And, and so this is one of the things where if you don't have a lot of data points, um, I don't know how many you know, Argentinian uh, speakers, the, the, the people that created the software had to train on, um, and probably not, not a lot. So um, what's the responsibility of an insurance company, for example, if it's going to a new market, and let's say it's, um, you know, they traditionally had uh, certain types of people in, that they've uh, covered, um, now they're being exposed to, let's say, a different population. Um, they may not have any data at all about that population. Um, so they might have to make a proactive effort to go out and actually maybe even take on risks that they normally wouldn't cover just to begin collecting that data. So that's one example. That's my short and dirty uh, answer. Great. You tied it right back into the session in multiple ways. Thanks, Michael. Yeah. Okay, so let's let's do our lightning round of question. Um, and um, kind of all did this in your presentation, so maybe it's a little bit of a softball, but we'd like you to just go back and talk about the one thing that you'd like um, our audience to take back with them um, as they log off today. Um, let's start with you, Karen, if that's okay. Sure, so I really wanted to think about something that, that somebody could do this afternoon. Um, and so what I thought was if, if you could look back on your own life and your own experiences and think of somebody that was kind of a pioneer or did things differently and, you know, think back across your career um, and reach out to them and ask them about their story. Like learn more about the thought they put into those choices and how they decided to do what they did. And I bet you will learn a ton and it will expand your perspective on a lot of things. Talithia, how about you? Um, I didn't suggest this in my talk, but I'll say it now, is to invite someone to lunch or dinner. Um, often we've had colleagues over, and quite frankly, who've just never been in the home of another Black person. And I can see it when they walk in, and they're just like, wow. Um, and somehow <laughs> opening up my space or, like, them inviting us over is just a way to kind of make common ground, right, and just um, really kind of get to know each other or have our families get to know each other. So that might be like a strong step for some folks. So maybe start with coffee or lunch. Um, and if there's a power dynamic, you want to think about that as well. But I really want to sort of challenge people to, to invite folks into their personal space and be open to, to engaging someone in their personal space as well. Awesome. I'm going around round robin here. Michael, you're next. Yeah, so I mean, we're, we're in a world where algorithms are increasingly running things. So if you guys have a cell phone, probably every single app you have is running some sort of algorithm in the background. So just bringing the awareness of that there are these issues of bias and, and fairness that exist and kind of starting to question that, um, I think is, is something that I think people are starting to, to do. And hopefully this is just raised awareness for that. Thanks. And Alejandra, how about you? What's your takeaway? No. Short, sweet, and repetitive. Uh, bring an outsider in, so you know, go go the extra mile. Uh, just you know, let them know you're you're there. Great. I'm hearing a theme with all of these is is sort of like get into that personal story and and look beyond the data, look beyond the objective, and try to get in and, and learn what that learn what that is really going on behind the scenes of that person. 
Absolutely. So we are coming close to our time. Um, I would ask Jesse to bring back up the slides just for a moment. <clears throat> And we, of course, would like to say a big thank you to all of our speakers, Michael Shaw, Talithia Williams, Alejandra Nolibos, and Karen DeToro. Great job, and thank you so much for answering all of our questions. Um, we also want to thank the committee that helped to put this all together. So behalf of, on behalf of myself and Sarah um, and the Casualty Actuarial Society and the Society of Actuaries, we really appreciate all of the time and effort that you all put into this um, session today. Um, and last, of course, Sarah and I would like to thank everyone who joined us in the audience this afternoon. Thanks again for your proactive tech comments and also your great questions to our speakers. Uh, we hope you enjoyed this session. We hope you'll check out more Dive In Festival sessions over the next few days. Thanks again to Dive In for inviting us to be a part of this great festival. So thanks, everyone, and have a good night. <laughs>